<laughs> All right, let's get going. So um, we've been talking about various forms of uh, data warehousing, and pretty much for the bulk of the, the term, we've been talking about uh, sort of when, when we talk about query processing, uh, we've been talking about uh, queries over relatively static data. Uh, I mean, we've talked about updates, but in general, the, the focus has been on um, asking questions about data that stays pretty much constant. So today, we're going to be talking about uh, a couple of, uh, I'm going to give you sort of a high level of overview of a couple of different techniques uh, for sort of the, the, the dual problem. Um, what happens uh, when the, the data stays, uh, sorry, when, when the query is what stays relatively constant and the data is the thing that uh, changes rapidly. Um, there's, so not all of this is covered in the textbook. Uh, there, there should be uh, one additional paper posted on Piazza. Um, yeah, so, right. Uh, with respect to project two, uh, it has been graded. The grades have been posted. Um, there were a couple of glitches I've been noticing with the uh, test, uh, with the testing harness. In particular, if you modified any of the default values in index.java, uh, please let me know because that probably means that your grade should be higher. Um, but yeah, uh, they should be posted on UD Learns. Have a look and. Um, okay, so uh, the the bulk of uh, so we've been talking about um, in, in a database. Typically, what happens is that you have a reasonably fixed data set. Uh, I mean, the, the data set might be changing; it might be uh, getting updated. But in general, the the model uh, when you ask a question, uh, you're usually asking a question assuming that the data is a constant. Uh, that the data is fixed. And the idea is then to uh, be able to ask lots of questions, uh, lots of different questions about the same data. Um, what we're going to talk about today uh, with uh, respect to stream processors and incremental view maintenance uh, is a set of, um, is, is sort of the, the inverse of that, uh, where you have a fixed set of queries. You know exactly what you're asking, uh, but then what's changing is the data. So there's a couple of challenges that arise in this, uh, in this context. Uh, so just like with online aggregation, uh, we need to make sure that the queries, uh, that, that when we do query processing, uh, we can't block. And so we're going to use uh, something called half joins, uh, which are very similar in, in, in principle to the ripple joins that we talked about. Um, one other challenge is that because the data is changing rapidly, we want to make sure that we can keep up with those changes. Uh, usually, the, there are uh, so-called real-time constraints that, uh, that we need to satisfy to make sure that uh, I mean, the, the, the data is coming in. If the data is coming in faster than we can process it, uh, either something's gone wrong or uh, we, need to do, we need to do something about it. Um, and so the, the first thing we're going to do there is, is predominantly, uh, in, the, in the context of uh, screen processors, uh, the vast majority of them use uh, the window joints, that, uh, the window joint semantics that we talked about in order to limit uh, how much uh, computational cost there is uh, to, a particular, um, to a particular joint operation. I'll get into that in a moment. Um, the other thing is that the, the data might even arrive uh, faster than we can handle it. Uh, so, I imagine you're, you're getting a, a feed of tweets uh, from, from Twitter. Uh, huge numbers of tweets are generated at any given point in time. Um, the machine can't, uh, your, your hardware might not necessarily be able to handle uh, that, that vast amount of data. So we need, to be able, we need to have a couple of different strategies for um, dropping tuples in order to uh, optimize the um, optimize the accuracy of the, the query results that we're providing. Uh, so just to sort of recap, um, window semantics basically allow you to uh, define a sort of sort order over the data and then define a particular range of values uh, 
on that data. And then when you perform a, a query, when you analyze the, the data, you can get some sort of uh, aggregate computation uh, about all of the tuples in this particular range. More precisely, uh, if you're trying to do um, R join S, we're not going to join every tuple of R, sorry, every tuple of R against every tuple of S. We're going to define a window over each of these, and every time we uh, and we're we're going to restrict the join uh, to tuples that appear in in a window at any given point in time. So, for example. Uh, with these two particular windows, we join all of these tuples of R against all of these tuples in S. Um, then, when we slide the window over, that gives us a new set of joints. And in particular, uh, two things will happen. So, sliding the window over, we're going to introduce a new tuple into the window, which means we're going to introduce a new set of join results. And Something to note is that the only possible join results are, uh, that, that we could possibly introduce by adding a tuple into the window are uh, joins between this tuple and some tuple in R. So in other words, all of the new, uh, the new results that are produced when we slide the window over have to include this tuple. Is that, does that make sense? Any questions on that? And similarly, when we eliminate a tuple, when we pull a tuple out of the window, the only tuples that uh, the, the join result of the two windows shrinks a bit, and it shrinks precisely by those tuples, uh, by those output tuples that are constructed from this, uh, this tuple that just fell off the window. Uh, that said, we're going to ignore that for, for the time being and, and just focus on uh, all of the tuples that were at one point uh, part of this join result. And precisely, a, a stream join is going to produce a continual stream of newly arriving outputs. Um, every time we get a, get a new tuple into one of our inputs, we're going to join it against all of the tuples in uh, the other window and then produce a set of new outputs. Now, uh, the, the first problem here is that typically our join algorithms, the join algorithms, uh, at least that we've talked about so far, um, require you to finish, to complete one stream uh, before you can proceed on to another stream. And so what a, uh, a, streaming window, a streaming window join needs to be able to support uh, arbitrary insertions into either side of, uh, into either relation. It needs to be able to handle new data coming from both sides of, of the join. And so we're going to use uh, essentially something that's very uh, thematically similar to the, the ripple join, uh, where we can sort of insert uh, into either stream and, and basically uh, read from either side. Um, now, of course, the problem, we, we can't necessarily support. Uh, the problem here is that this is still going to take uh, time that's linear in the size of the window. So we need to be able to do that join much more efficiently. And in order to do that, uh, we can actually build an index over the contents of a given window. So uh, when a new tuple shows up, let's say in relation R, uh, if we have such an index, we can use that index to very quickly identify tuples in S that join against that newly arrived tuple of T. Uh, but now we also have to do a little bit of maintenance work. So uh, we're building a, an index over the window on R, so we have to actually insert the new tuple into that index, and then make sure that any tuples that have uh, sort of fallen off the end of that window uh, are properly expired and deleted from the index. So this kind of boils down to our, our traditional indexing problem. We have, uh, we have to figure out what kind of indices are most appropriate for our given task. So one example of an 
Well, we, we have talked about a couple of indices, hash and B plus tree, so uh, we could just skip the index altogether. Um, and of course, there's a couple of advantages to each of them. We'll uh, talk about trade-offs a little bit further. Uh, but I want you to think about something, because I'm going to ask uh, in, a, in a couple of slides. When you insert a new tuple, well, we've, we've talked about insertions into indices. We've talked about uh, how, what, what kind of challenges arise, uh, or how, how, how difficult it is to insert into each of, the, in, in, into each of these indices. But something I want you to think about over the next couple of slides is why, uh, what kind of challenges arise when you want to delete specific tuples? And specifically, how can we optimize for the case that we have a very specific pattern uh, to the tuples that we're deleting from the window? Now, when I say window, uh, just to be clear, what I mean here is that when, we, uh, when a new tuple arrives, we have to insert it, into, insert it and remove it, uh, insert it into, remove it from uh, the index structure that we're building over that window. So I'll give you one of those for free. And that's uh, with the nested loop join. That is to say, when you're not actually building any sort of index, well, you don't actually have to do any sort of uh, significant invalidation. You have your uh, window, a new tuple slides into the window, and the old tuple, as long as you preserve the order of that, uh, of the tuples. Yes? Uh, it'll be built on these tuples, and it will be built on the join predicate, based on the join predicate. So you can think of the, uh, yes, that's correct. Um, so it's, it's not linear in the size of the entire stream, but it, uh, the, the cost of the join will still be linear in the size of the window. And if you want your window to be, let's say, 100 tuples, that's 100 operations that you need to perform every single time a new tuple arrives. Is, uh, is that your, your question, or does that address your, your concern? Um, right. Okay, so if, if we're not building an index, this is trivial. We keep just a, a sorted list of, of all of the tuples, uh, and we keep it sorted based on uh, insertion order. Easy. New tuple goes to the front of the list, old tuple falls off the end of the list. Uh, every time we add a new tuple, we mm -hmm. delete it and say old tuple. Depends on what kind of window you're using. If you're using a fixed size window, then yes. If you're using a variable sized window, uh, then you need to. You still need to um, figure out whether any of the the tuples have been invalidated. So, if, for example, your your window size is uh, two months, then if I insert a tuple here, then I let's say I insert a tuple here uh, for April. 18th, then any tuples that occurred uh, before February 18th fall off. So in, uh, basically, in one case, you're, uh, if, if the window size is fixed, every insertion causes exactly one deletion. Uh, if the window size is dependent on some sort of data semantics, such as everything in a, in a two-month window, then um, then it, we may delete zero or more tuples from the window. Is that, any other questions? Okay, um, right, so in this case, we're, we're always deleting the last tuple. This is, this is a constant time operation to do a deletion. But now let's say we build some sort of tree index. Um, now the tuples are no longer sorted in tree order. So how do we how do we deal with this? The tuples are going to be sorted in in data order. Let's do that for the time order. Well, so uh, we want them if 
in order to delete them, um, to delete a tuple, so we're always, uh, okay, the, the high level goal here that we're trying to achieve is that we're always going to be deleting tuples in time order uh, as they're inserted. Uh, in this case, they're going to be sorted in the order uh, based on whatever predicate the join is being performed over. So if, for example, I'm uh, doing an inequality join based on, uh, I don't know, cost, cost of product sold. These are going to be sorted in in terms of cost. But uh, every table can can equal to two, uh, one tree and one queue. You can do that. So there you go. So the uh, the basic strategy is that you can either maintain a, a, an array or a linked list uh, that is maintained in the insertion in the order of insertions. Uh, you keep track of that, and you'll always dump the last tuple off the end. Um, now, hash indices are a little bit more tricky because here, oh, sorry. So, uh, in order to use this structure, you're still going to need to update the tree as well. And so, you're going to have to, basically, you need to know exactly the tuple that you're deleting, and you have to update the entire tree accordingly. Um, In the case of, and there's this nice property that the, the leaves, essentially each of the leaves uh, can be modified independently. Once you, once you have the appropriate leaf node, then um, the, the amount of work that you need to do to remove a tuple from a leaf node is constant based on, on the size of that leaf node. Uh, in a hash table, that's a little bit trickier because you, you can have potentially multiple entries in a particular hash bucket. Uh, so for example, if you have uh, a hash table here with three entries in that bucket, one entry in each of these buckets, if we want to, in if we want to delete uh, an entry from this list, we're not only going to need to uh, keep track of how many, of, of which tuple is, uh, is the first tuple. Uh, we're not only going to need to keep track of which bucket is the next thing to be deleted from. That's something we can do with this kind of data structure. We're also going to have to keep track of which of these values uh, we're going to erase. So uh, one, one strategy for doing that is to keep the tuples uh, sorted, uh, keep the tuples within the bucket uh, sorted based on order, uh, insertion order, so that the, the last tuple in each bucket is always going to be the last tuple um, that was inserted of any of the tuples in the bucket. When you delete something, it's always going to be the last uh, constant time operation to, to delete anything from there. OK, so each of these index structures, uh, you can build it on essentially half of what a, the algorithm that I've presented, uh, this, this the algorithm that I've, I've shown you is, is basically sufficient to perform essentially half of a join. Uh, you're receiving tuples uh, from one of the two streams, and that tuple is being joined against the other window, and then simultaneously uh, inserted into its own local index. So this is. Like I said, this is, this is basically enough to, pr uh, to process half of the join. And in order to do a, a full join, you need to take essentially two of these uh, half joins and, and combine them together. You basically need to pick two different indices, um, one for each side of the join. What's the meaning of half join? So a half join is, is basically this... Uh, this algorithm. So when a tuple arrives uh, in R, we'll join it against S's window based on S's and in whatever index we've selected for S, and then we will insert it into its local uh, local index. Now, this is sufficient for tuples arriving from R, but we also need a similar algorithm uh, for tuples arriving from S. 
And the, the, the key distinction here is that the index that we build here is completely independent. The, the selection of, we essentially have to build two index structures, one for each window. And the choice of index structure that we use is entirely independent. So if um, entirely independent of the, the choice of index structure that we use for the other side. So we could build a hash index on one of the two windows. We could build a tree index on the other. We could build a hash index on one. We could just completely skip the index on the other one and, and do a, a straight up scan. Does that make sense? Does that? Give me one more slide here. And so to, to basically build a streaming join, you take two of these, these half joins, where each half join is, is one of these, these index structures. And the, the choice of which half join uh, we use for either side is going to depend on essentially the relative rates at which we, uh, we insert tuples into either of these streams. So if we insert lots of tuples into one of the two streams, but only a few tuples into another stream, um, that, will, that will change things around. Uh, so out of curiosity, uh, they, the, the authors of, of the, um, is there any, is there ever a situation where you would want to use a nested loop joint in this element? Or at least one side of the element? Okay. Yes, actually. Yep. Uh, so, if can you give a, a sense of why that is? The vendor needs to be moved on the population. That's that is common. So you need. Um, okay. So you have one stream and one fixed data set, and you have some window over here. Uh, where would you use the nest? Which of the two would you put? Uh, build an index over, and which of them would you not? Uh, okay. Okay. So you have some index on there, and why? Uh, why would you not build an index over this? That would require addition every time. Okay, so if, if you did build an index over this, you'd have to do an insertion. Uh, you'd have to update this index every single time you did any sort of change. Um, now, that there are still some cases where that's beneficial, so why is it in particular beneficial to not do that in this case? So we're, we're putting work into building this index. But the argument that I've been making so far is that having an index is useful. Why is it not useful to have an index in this case? Because the window that I can say is not going to change. Uh, sorry? The window that I can say is not going to change. Exactly. So you're never going to actually use that index. So, yep. And in fact, here's some little numbers from the paper. Uh, so you have essentially all combinations of hash, tree, uh, well, t uh, they use something called a T tree, which is not quite a B plus tree, but close enough. Um, so hash, T tree, and nested loop. And you'll note over here, uh, we have this nice little point. Oh, sorry. On the x-axis, this it's the ratio of insertions into either stream. So in on the left hand side. Uh, the, the left-hand side stream gets no tuples. The right-hand side stream gets uh, insertions only happen to, into the right-hand side stream. And here we have the reverse, where uh, the left-hand side stream gets a bunch of insertions. The right-hand side stream uh, gets nothing. So you'll note over here, there's this nice little uh, optimal space, which corresponds to the case where we're building a tree index over the left-hand side and we're using a nested loop join uh, for the right-hand side. And it's essentially 
identical to that particular case. And then as we move along, uh, the, it, if we even get a little bit of uh, insertion going on, uh, it starts paying off to use, the, uh, to use a hash index. And moving along, so uh, basically if, if, if this side is, even, is changing even a little bit, it almost always pays uh, to have a hash index built over, uh, over this side, if nothing else, yes. So the last loop join is no index. Sorry? The, the last loop is the join. Yes, no index. No index. So we'll scan all the window. Yeah, so if you want, um, essentially, uh, where's the eraser? The idea is, is basically the, the same thing that we do in a, in a traditional nested loop join. Uh, if a tuple arrives in this window, we compare it to every single tuple and then apply a selection predicate to filter out the missing ones. On the other hand, if the insertion rate here is zero, you're never actually going to compare against anything. So the, the cost of maintaining a uh, nested loop the cost of maintaining that index is non-existent. Er, you don't need to pay the uh, the cost of maintaining an index over that because it's an unnecessary overhead. The average one will take a uh, number of times and the index. Right. So if if you do have insertions into this stream, you're going to need to join. If you do have insertions over this stream, then it pays to have an index on this because the index will speed up the, the processing of joins uh, when tuples arrive here. When tuples arrive here, you want to have an index over this window. So tuples in, that arrive on this, um, let's give these names, R and S. So a tuple that arrives on R is going to be joined against every tuple in the uh, window on S. So if we have an index on that, then, then we can do that much more efficiently. Let me back up a little bit then. The, uh, so in a window join, you're, you're basically joining every tuple in here against every tuple in here. When a new tuple arrives, there's already a bunch of tuples. You've already produced a bunch of tuples on either side. And the idea is to essentially just keep producing uh, only the, the newly arriving tuples. So if I were to slide this stream down, this tuple creates a, a bunch of new outputs, right? And all of those outputs are going to be basically the result of inserting that one tuple, or joining that one tuple against the window on S. So if we have an index on, the, on S, on the window of S, we can very quickly identify the, the tuples that join against this specific one tuple. OK. So it pays to have an index on S if, if we're getting insertions. On the other hand, if if, we're, if S is fixed, if S is never being updated, if S is never modified, no new tuples arrive, we're never going to need to join against this window. So our building an index, there's an ex and there is an overhead, and so we, yeah, exactly. And so that's this this one case where we're never update in this at this particular point on the left hand side. We're never updating uh, S. And so we can build a, uh, actually I think this is flipped, but yeah, so the, the, the graph is flipped from that diagram. So in this case, we're never updating, um, we're never uh, updating that side. So we build a tree index on the side that isn't being updated, and we just use a nested loop joint for the side that is. So eventually we get to a point where having, uh, right, so the, the, 
there is a cost for uh, the tree index as well, and that cost grows with the rate at which insertions occur. Um, Uh, the so in this uh, in this particular case, hash no sorry, um, the cost of maintaining the hash index uh, grows as, uh, is is higher than the cost of maintaining a tree index. So in this particular case, we want to build a hash index. We eventually get to a point where it starts paying off. Uh, no, sorry, the tree index is more expensive. So eventually, we get to a point where it uh, it pays to switch over to a purely hash-based uh, strategy. And, and if we keep uh, going up, um, there's there's sort of a crossover point. So basically, the the choice of which index to use doesn't necessarily just depend on. Um, doesn't just depend on the, the type of join predicate we're using. Uh, even if we're using an equality predicate, uh, if tree indices are relatively expensive to do lookups on, but they're relatively cheap to update, whereas hash indices have sort of the reverse problem. So in this case, we actually want to build a, a tree index on the uh, Sorry, in this particular range, we want to build a hash index on uh, the relatively slowly changing uh, window. And once we get here, it stops. That stops paying off. Uh, okay, so yeah, there's there's a nice cost model behind this. Uh, the paper is actually there's a lot of formulas in it, but it's it's actually quite readable. I, I encourage you to look at it. Um, you know probably be a couple of questions on uh, sort of estimating costs in this particular model for their homework. So have a look at that. Um, okay, we, ah, we have, we have to. Okay, uh, so one thing that we kind of very briefly mentioned earlier in the term uh, was this idea of views. And I just want to recap um, so a view is essentially a named query. So I can say uh, create view enterprise officer, and I can define that as uh, based on a, a, just a standard SQL query. So in this case, I'm defining it, uh, the, the enterprise officer's relation, or sorry, the enterprise officer view as uh, the query uh, that picks out all of, all of the officers that are on the enterprise. There's a missing predicate there. Um, the basic idea then is that anytime you have, you can treat that view as if it were a normal relation. So recall that uh, any relation, any query is, is itself a relation. So when we write an arbitrary query, we can reference the view and say select EO.name from enterprise officer EO. And the database will essentially take that and sort of replace it uh, just in line with the, de the query definition. I mean, this, this is not super, super crazy stuff. Uh, are there any questions on it? Okay. Uh, now, the problem is that these views, the view definition queries can be fairly complex. And if they are, reasonably expensive to, to compute. And if, it, if this is an important enough thing that uh, you decided you wanted a shorthand for it, there's a good chance you'll be executing this query over and over and over again. So there's this idea of materialized views, where we actually take the, the query results, we store it on disk, and we basically create a table uh, that stores the results of that particular query. So then, when we need to uh, when we need to ask uh, when the, the query does actually appear, uh, sorry, when the view does actually appear in a query, uh, the results of the view definition are already stored, already available for you. Uh, so you just need to read them off of disk. You can 
do other things like index them and, and yes. Yeah, but the data might change in the original uh, relationship. Yep. So what if the data changes? Well, you have a couple of different strategies. Um, you can either reevaluate the full query from scratch. Now that's expensive. Um, and so what I'm going to try and give you a whirlwind tour of in the next uh, 10 minutes is this idea of delta queries. So a delta query, and I'm going to introduce a little bit of, of terminology here. Let's call your entire database D and your query Q. And so I'm going to call Q a function. So if I apply Q to my database D, then that's the result of running that query on that particular database. Now let's say you make some change to the database, uh, and I'm going to call that delta D. I'm going to be this is this is uh, I'm going to be fairly abstract about this, but you can think of that as either an insertion or some sort of deletion. I'm going to be very liberal with the the plus operator here uh, and say that the new result is basically going to be the result of adding this modification uh, to the original database D. So if I insert a tuple, this, this D plus delta D is going to be the de database with the new tuple. If I delete a tuple, uh, then this is going to be the database without that tuple. And so the, the, the sort of core insight of incremental view maintenance is this idea that if, if we have already computed uh, Q of D, we can get Q of D plus delta D much faster. And to, to give you sort of an intuition on, as to why that is, um, let me sort of draw an analogy to, sum, uh, to summation. Let's say we have a bunch of numbers and we add a new number to that set and we're trying to compute uh, the sum of all of the numbers. If we have the sum of these numbers, 88, then we don't necessarily need to know, uh, we don't need to touch any of these values because we already have their sum. We insert a new value, we just add that value to the total uh, and all we're set. Now it turns out relational algebra has some very nice uh, properties that make it amenable to, to this sort of reasoning. Um, so let's say you have a selection predicate. And let's say you have uh, the original relation R and the delta relation delta R. How would we compute uh, the change in the result? The, any new tuples that get created or, any, or deleted. If we have both of these expressed as relations. So if the, if the deleted tuple uh, fulfills the condition, uh, sorry, the inserted tuple fulfills the condition, we insert it. Um, if the deleted tuple, uh, if we're deleting a tuple, then this is a little bit different, but um, Think of sort of this, this abstract idea of, of negative tuples. So if the, if the tuple doesn't exist, then uh, doesn't uh, fulfill the, the cri criteria, then the tuple that was originally inserted in its place didn't fulfill the criteria either. And if it does fulfill the criteria, then at some point there was an output uh, so we can pass the deletion up the chain. What about uh, projection? Uh, well, that works pretty much the same way. You project the, the changed tuple down a little bit, and there you go. But then we have a problem. Um, how do we deal with set semantics? So what happens if, I, if, R, if the original R uh, contains uh, the tuple 1, 2? Uh, the original tuple contain, uh, the original R has, um, one, two, two, uh, one, three, one, four. And now um, the change is going to be an insertion. I'm going to insert the tuple one, five. Sorry? What's the projection? Oh, sorry. And the projection is down to A. Yeah. 
So what's the change in, what's the original result? Let's start with that. One. What is the changed result? One. Right. So how would we go about that? Yep. So insertion in this case is not necessarily a huge problem, but then deletion uh, becomes one. And so typically the way this, that this is handled, actually, does anyone have an idea how, how to address this? Okay, so you could you could um, do the deletion and then recompute the entire subquery from scratch. Can you do better? So let's say I give you the ability to um, change what you store, to store some additional information about the output of this this relation. What kind of additional information uh, would help you to keep track of the number, hmm? number. The number of well, great. So if if then this output had sort of this, uh, so this is going to be project A R. Uh, so we have A, but now if this uh, relation had sort of this hidden count column, you could then uh, produce one, originally three, and the count would just go up or down. And as soon as it hits zero, the tuple is no longer present in the relation. Yes? You're trying to delete one five, and one five is... Oh, uh, sorry, if... Minus one four. What if you were trying to delete one that was there? Then you'd have to check against the original relation to see if it actually exists. But that's a constant time operation, or at the very least, uh, depending on what kind of index structure you have over the original relation, you can either do it in constant or at worst log, log in. Okay, uh, right. So what about joins? And the first half of this lecture should help you answer this. So what if I insert a tuple into R? How would I how would I compute the, the change in result? I have the original R, the original S, and the change the change to R. Oh, sorry? Oh, sorry. Uh, join S and and delta and delta. Yep. So, is that a word? Um, R and okay. So essentially, this is this is a half join. Um, you're inserting a or deleting some number of tuples from uh, R. You just join them against S, and that gives you the new set of tuples. Uh, if there are tuples deleted, you do exactly the same thing. And you can sort of propagate these, these deletions uh, up and down. Uh, by the way, if you're, you're interested in, in this, this is one of my areas of research. So uh, please, please drop by my office. Um, so how about, does, does deletion, yeah, deletion doesn't necessarily change anything here. Um, so basically my last sort of open question here is uh, how do you handle aggregates? So, okay, some min max also, um, but what kind of structural changes do you need to make to the? Uh, so so far we've we've talked about. Talk, I've been very hand wavy about how uh, insertions and deletions happen. Um, we've been talking about things in terms of tuples, right? So if, uh, a new tuple gets inserted. That's that's just a tuple, and if there's a deletion. We're essentially keeping track of, uh, I hesitate to use, use the term, but something like negative tuples or anti tuples. Um, how would you express that in terms of aggregate values? 
So let me give you an example here. Project delta r. Select r. The uh, the delta query for that is uh, select delta r. And um, join r s. The delta query with respect to r is delta r join s. Something to, to sort of uh, it, an, an interesting puzzle. Um, Try and, try and come up with a similar phrasing for the delta of an aggregate query. And I think you'll find that, the, that running this on, on just raw relational algebra is not, going to is not going to be easy or even possible. Um, at least not in general. So uh, anyway. Uh, with that, um, and we'll finish up data data warehousing on Friday with uh, common stores.